I am very much privileged to introduce to you our speaker. He is a diplomat and fellow in physical medicine and rehabilitation, also in sports medicine and regenerative medicine. He is also consultant in Medical City, South Luzon. He has two kids, a boy and a girl, ages seven and five respectively, and one wife, Mrs. Kina De Castro. So let us now give our time and our undivided attention to our speaker, Dr. Jimmy Lou De Castro. Good morning. Thank you, Christine, for the introduction. I'm so happy that uh, I'm back home. This is my home. Amen. I used to be in this place. And I'm glad that uh, my friends sang a very nice song. You know, Edwin, your chairman of your department, used to be my classmate. And Sir Ferdy, as we call him, used to be with me when we sort of um, song, sing songs, and uh, we always, uh, I don't know if you can remember it, the name of our group is uh, Broken Chords. Remember that? <laughs> because we always sing with broken chords. <laughs> and of course, Sir Arit uh, used to be my teacher when I was uh, having my chemistry subjects also in the same school. So it's like a family to me, and I'm just so glad to be back here. And uh, when I receive the information that I'm going to talk with a group of students, I, the first question that I ask is, what kind of students are they? Are they part of uh, what particular college? And when I knew that it's uh, science and technology, I said, okay, I would probably uh, be there and to study with you the Bible and probably share with you some experiences that looking at you as students, I was once just like you. I was uh, a product, I should say, of prayer, faith, and hard work. So it's probably not any of you here who has been privileged to be here and just waiting for your allowances to come. In my time, I'm working and I'm working as a student colporteur. How many of you here have been through working as a student corporator, going around, selling books, magazines. That's, okay, for those of you who are just like that, I went through my college education that way. Every summer, every vacation, I find a way to go somewhere to work. Otherwise, I would not be able to study in AUP because as you can see, the tuition fees is really expensive, right? Do you agree? Okay. So before we begin, let's bow our heads for prayer. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you so much, dear God, for this beautiful opportunity to be here. We thank you, dear God, for giving us life and strength, for your grace, for your unwavering grace that you're always provided each one of us. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to be in our midst today, that our words and our actions will be in accordance to your will, and that they may be inspired to do your will in whatever way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today we are going to study with you. If you have your Bibles with you, I'm sure you brought with you your Bibles or probably your iPad or whatever it is that you have with you. I just would like to start reading again the text that was uh, read to us this morning, which will serve as our key text. In Jeremiah 9, 23 to 24, it says, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. This is a beautiful text. This is one of my favorite texts. 
Now, since I'm talking to a lot of students here, I probably will address my talk to all of you who are students. Only because as students, you have a lot of aspirations, you have a lot of ambitions in life. You would like to be like this, to be this, to be that in the future. But you will never know what will happen in between, right? In other words, you have no idea what's going to happen. And you have no idea whether what your choices are, are the best choices for you. Sometimes the choices that you have right now may not be the best choice for you. Sometimes your status at the present will change eventually. You'll never know that. Every day we make decisions and those decisions are very, very important. When I say earlier that I am a product of prayer and I'm a product of faith and hard work, I really mean that. Because in all our lives, in all my life, there's no other way to know God's will than to pray in faith and exert a lot of hard work in order to reach the point that you would like to be. Now, the first thing that I would like to tell you is that it's always good to be successful, right? But it's better to be faithful than to be successful. You've seen a lot of people around who probably may be very, very successful. And you sometimes envy them because they have something you don't have. They have this status, they have these possessions, and everything you wish you have, they have. But eventually you realize that there's more to that than what you see. In other words, there stands between you and your God something that you need to discover, something that you need to learn, and that is dependence on God. And there is what we call unintended consequences. If you have heard that word, or probably the first time you've heard that word, unintended consequences, what do you mean by that? That really means that sometimes when we decide on certain things, we put on the left side the advantages and to the right side the disadvantages. And then eventually, depending on the advantage and the disadvantage, we weigh things over and we come up with something that's going to give us more advantage than disadvantage. We would not want to decide on things that is disadvantageous to us. We always decide on things that is advantageous. Something like, how much is a salary? Is the salary higher here or here? So that's an advantage. Will this give me more time for my family, probably, or less time for my family? Will I be given a privilege to travel abroad and see things somewhere, some somehow abroad so that probably is an advantage will that give me a higher position will i be the chairman will i be the president so that's an advantage for you and depending on those choices we make a decision but let me tell you this even in spite of all these advantages you will always make a mistake and those mistakes that you make are what you call unintended consequences. Because depending on what you decide, you have wisely made a decision, right? You based your decision on what is advantageous for you. But in spite of what you have decided, you find yourself really at the losing end. So you question yourself, what happened? What happened? Now I would like to tell you a story that's recorded in the Bible, which is found in Exodus 14, 13, and 14. And my whole talk will be just on this particular text. Now, this is a story, and I'm sure you know how this story came about. This is the time when the Israelites were actually moving towards the Red Sea from Egypt. They were just given the clearance by the Pharaoh of Egypt to go wherever they wanted, to the promised land. They didn't know where that is. They were just told to go to the promised land. And so they were caught between the Red Sea and, of course, the road leading to the Red Sea. And they were about to cross somewhere. We don't know where, but they're on the Red Sea. 
But looking at this verse, the situation is that when they reached that area, they were asked by God, okay, move a little backwards. Instead of moving forward, they were asked to move backwards. And then they were actually caught in between the Red Sea in front of them, two mountains beside them, and not yet, but eventually they heard the Egyptian were trying to pursue them. So you see a situation here where about 2 million Israelites were caught in between the Red Sea, the two mountains, and the Egyptian armies right behind them. And these are not just regular armies. They're the best of the best. In Exodus, they mentioned about 600 chariots. And these are choice chariots and soldiers trying to pursue them. In other words, they can actually pursue them and actually get them back to Egypt. Their goal was to bring them back because according to Pharaoh, he made a mistake. Why did he actually allow the children of Israel to leave and go where they wanted to go and do whatever they want? So in other words, this is their situation. We know that during those times, they were being protected by what? During daytime. By the pillar of clouds and at night by a pillar of fire. It sort of guides them wherever they would, they would go. And so, for this particular instance, when the Israelites knew that the Egyptians were trying to pursue them, they were so scared. And they tried to murmur to Moses and said, Moses, why did you bring us here in the middle of the desert? It would be much better for us to serve the Egyptians and not die in the middle of the desert. And so they were, so most of them are just complaining. Can you just bring us back to Egypt where we can serve the Egyptians and do whatever we wanted? Anyway, it's okay with us. Instead of letting us die in the middle of the desert. And so in verse 13, Moses said, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. Isn't that a good promise? If you were in that situation, will you believe God in this kind of situation? I mean, if you are in a very hard situation, will you ever believe and listen to God and say, don't be fearful, fear not, stand still. When you are in a chaotic, confused state, what do you do? You're so uneasy, right? You try to find ways to be able to solve your problems as if you can solve them. But here God is saying, fear ye not. Stand still. Kumbaga sa Tagalog, relax ka lang, tahimik ka lang, wag kang magulo. I'll be in charge. But most often, we cannot stay still, right? If eventually, you will not be able to move to the next level because you have, you have some financial trouble, your parents could not send you money, or probably you failed in one exam and you cannot proceed. So these are challenges that you face as a student, and probably... There are a lot more. What do you do? Do you actually stand still and fear not? And see the salvation of the Lord. And in verse 14 it says, The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Now there are lessons here that I would like us to learn. Number one is, recognize that God is in control. Do we still believe that God is in control? How many of you believe that God is in control? Thank you. You've seen a lot of troubles around us. Problems here, problems there. Everywhere. The people that might be sitting beside you is giving you so much problem or making gossips that tends to irritate you. So, what's the point? We have to recognize that there is God in charge of us. And the most important thing is, make God your 
partner. Have you ever made God your partner? A lot of us, I mean, where, whatever status we may have reached, there is always a time when people get into trouble. A fellow colleague of mine approached me and said, can you help me uh, with my you know, problems? I have this uh, problem in my practice. You see, even doctors like us have problems. And sometimes they would approach you and say, can you help me apply here, apply there, so that I can also do this and that? And I, they would be surprised when I always tell them, have you ever made God your partner? I mean, when was the last time we ever kneel and pray sincerely to God and ask for his guidance and his help? We only do that when we are in trouble, right? But what do we do when we're not in trouble? We don't do anything. Last week, I was in Boston. I was lecturing in a conference. And on Sabbath day, I went to church in Boston. I was there 8 o'clock in the morning. And guess what? Nobody was around. It was a beautiful church. To me, it's like a heritage church because it was really, really beautiful. It's nice. It's made of bricks and beautifully designed. When I enter in, I was like, nobody was here. And probably somebody might catch me and say, I am doing something. But eventually, a, uh, a guy came in and he introduced himself to be a deacon of the church. And I asked him, what time do you st start your service? And he told me, around 9.30. But for sure, it's 10. I said, why is it like that? Because 9.30, they're just starting to come. So I said, how many church members do you have here? We have like 100. So it's a big church with 100 members. Anyway, I waited. Then, about 10 minutes later, I met a certain woman, and he introduced himself to be a Russian. So I noticed that in the main hall, there is this church, but on the sides, there is another hall where Russians met. So they have like also 100 members there. But slowly, slowly, he, she started telling me, you know, we have a problem in this church. Nobody's attending church. I said, why? I don't know. Probably signs of the times. I said, okay. And then he told me, can you speak something? I said, okay, I'll share. But I waited until it, it, it's about 9.30 and there's about seven of us in church. And then somebody came in. His name is Greg. I don't know if he's a church pastor. He didn't even introduce himself. But he said he'll gonna do the lesson study. 9.30 we're doing lesson study and only seven of us in church. So what happened was we were doing song service, and then he was asking, anybody who knows how to play piano? And nobody was playing the piano. So I said, I can play piano, but I will be the one to decide what song to play, to sing, because I will just play the song that I know how to play. So, okay. So he agreed. So we were singing, and then towards the end, it's already almost 10 o'clock, and nobody was around. I said, what's happening in this church? You see, most of you, or probably some of you, would like to go abroad, right? And probably you are thinking that when you go abroad, you will have lots of money, lots of this and that and this and that. But have you ever considered what will happen to you? What will happen to your spiritual life when you are in that place? I just feel, felt sad seeing that nobody was around. In fact, even at 10 o'clock, I thought there will be a, like 100 or probably just 50, but I've never seen such volume of people coming in. There's, they have so many materi reading materials, very nice reading materials. If you go inside the church, you'll see this table filled with all the you know, reading materials for the church. 
but I don't think they're reading it. So what I did, I picked up all of them. I bring it home. I said, I, I can have this. I can bring it home. It's just so sad. You are in an academic, you know, Boston is, la, is such an academic community. You have there the best schools so far. You have their Harvard. You have their all these Cambridge, MIT that you're dreaming to go to. These are good schools. But just like Paul, to the Greeks, Jesus is foolishness. To the Gentile, to the Jews, he is a stumbling block. Have you ever thought about Jesus in your life? Have you ever thought incorporating Jesus as part of your life? Wherever you may be, whatever you do, always put Jesus as your partner. You will never go wrong. And so, that's the first one. The second one is, fear ye not. Of course, when we go to a place, a new place probably, the, the usual feeling of fear is always there. We don't know. That's the fear of the unknown. We, we don't know what would, would happen. We would encounter people we never knew. In fact, when I realized that that's where the bombing happens in Boston during the marathon run, they pointed us that this is exactly the, the area where the bomb exploded. I said to myself, this seems to be not a safe place. When we were going out for dinner, I was, I feel a little eerie because something could just happen, you know. In America, they can own guns and they can hit you anytime that somebody would hit you. So it seems to me that it's not a good, a safe place. In the Philippines, it's safer to me because I can go around and nobody will hurt me. Probably will just do pickpockets, hold up, that's all. But killing you with guns, that's an entirely different story. So fear ye not. Fear ye not because God is your partner. God is your partner. The third one is stand still. If you are afraid, can you stand still? How many of you would stand still in the middle of somebody who's about to kill you? You'll be scared. You will, you, you'll, you'll do two things. Flight or fright. Okay? So, which is easier for you? In either way, you will be killed if that person will really kill you. But God, in this case, says, fear ye not, stand still. Just be calm. Just, in, in other translations, it says, just be calm. Easy ka lang. Don't make any unnecessary movements or probably don't worry about anything. Because, again, the only time you react that way. Remember the disciples? The disciples was with Jesus every day. But when a storm comes, they were so scared. They were like, Master, 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 wake up, wake up. Don't you know that we are on a storm? But here, God says, stand still. That will lead us to the next one, which is see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you when. When will he show you? Today. Today. I've got a friend. He came to me one day. He's really in, in a big financial trouble. So when he expresses to me his problems, he told me that he's doing this and that and that and that and that. So I said, okay, so what do you want me to do? I said, Jim, can you help me solve, I mean, alleviate some of my problems? Okay, sure, I'm I, I going to help you. But before I did that, I asked him one question. I said, have you ever involved God in your life? Are you giving tithes for God? 
And he could not answer me very quickly. He sort of, sometimes, sometimes not. So, I told him, without being so judgmental, I said, you know what? Try to be faithful to God. Because if you are not faithful to God, God will also will not be faithful to you. How do you expect God to be faithful to you if you are not faithful to Him? Somebody said, how dare you withdraw money from the bank if you're not making any deposit? We're not making any deposit, but we always wanted to what? To withdraw. That's our problem. We wanted to withdraw. We don't want to deposit. We have to deposit in God's bank. You know, it happened to me several years ago. I never gave tithes. You know why I don't give tithes? I'm sorry for <laughs> saying this. Because I said, didn't use it properly. I mean, some of our ministers are, are going into the nice hotel and of course being paid by our institution. So why should I give tithes? Until one day, you know what happened? I was, I was watching... Uh, Who's this? Mike Bilarde. Do you watch his show? Mike I don't watch his show, but, but suddenly when I opened the TV, it was his show. So I, I just said, okay. I, I listened because he's talking about money. So he said, God gave you, ang term niya is, liglig, siksik, umaapaw. And suddenly I said, I think he's correct. And he said, how dare we withdraw? Hindi naman tayo nagde-deposit. We cannot withdraw. So upon hearing his message, biglang tinamaan ako. Then I started giving. You see, it takes Mike Bilarde to invoke me to give tithes. I'm listening to our pastors. They never hit me. <laughs> Pero nung nagsalita si Mike Bilarde, tinamaan ako. It took about three months for me to struggle. Kasi para bang, naku, sayang naman ito, itata ito, sayang. Tapos napapansin mo, lumalaki. Tapos lagong sayang kasi lumalaki. Tapos pag malaki na, mas lalong sayang. But you know what? God taught me a lesson. One day, hindi ko binigay, Edwin, yung aking tight. I was driving in Bulacan. From Bulacan going to Manila, and suddenly somebody hit me from the back of the car. And you know what? When I have it fixed, kung ano yung amount nung sira nung sasakyan, exacto dun sa tight. And I was just, wow! So this is just what? A reminder for me. And since that time, I told myself, Whatever they do for the tithes, I don't really care. What is important is my relationship with God. Because God is the one who is giving you the blessings. It's not anybody else. He probably will use people, but eventually it's God who will give you blessings. It's not some other people. And so, that's where I started giving without any question. In fact, you will be amazed how God works. So when I told my friend about that, he had to give back tithes. And he said, this is only the amount I have. I said, that's, that's really a challenge. But you have to give anyway. God says, you have to return. That's not yours. You have to return it back and God is faithful. He will give back to you the blessings. He was a little sad when I told him that parang malungkot siya, hindi ko madrawing yung mukha niya na sinabihan ko siya ng ganun. Pero sabi ko sa kanya, pards, that's the only way. I've been through your problems, I've been through your challenges, but unless you remain faithful to the Lord, 
God will never be, be faithful to you. So if you want God to be your partner and to be faithful to you, try to be faithful to Him first. It says here in Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So it will return to you, what? Void? No. It's full. In fact, in Proverbs it says, the blessings of the Lord, it maketh rich and addeth no sorrow in it. In other words, you experience the blessings of God and you don't become what? Miserable. You see, a lot of people who are rich are miserable. They don't know how to manage their money, their time, their wealth. They're so stressed out. You see, the most stressful people are not us. They are the rich ones. They are the famous ones. Because they have so many things to be worried about. They worried about their security. They worried about their money. Na baka mabawasan. No? And sometimes they are the ones who are stingy. Mayaman siya, pero bakit ayaw niya mamigay? No? So those are the things that you see happening with these people. So the salvation of the Lord, He will show it to you today. He will not postpone it tomorrow, but He will show it to you today. Number five, assurance that even your enemies will not be seen anymore. Remember what it says in the last verse of Exodus? The Egyptians that you have seen today, you will never see them again for ever. We're so scared of Egyptians. The Egyptians are like the challenges that we have. You see, I encounter a personal challenge to my profession one time. People just are just so, they were trying to do something against me. They're trying to destroy whatever you have. And you know what I did? I just kneeled down and fasted and prayed. Have you ever fasted? Have you ever prayed? Probably you have prayed, but not really fasted. You see, there's a big difference if you fast and pray. It's like you're afflicting yourselves and asking God to really bless you. So one day, they had a meeting, and, and the topic of the meeting is me. Okay. That day, I know they're going to meet, so I fasted for like a week. On the day that they were meeting, there was a phone call by the chairman. And the, and the, and the phone call was, Sir, your father is in a critical condition. He is in the ICU. I think you have to attend to him first. So he halted the meeting. He, came all, he went all the way to the hospital to sort of try to find out what his father needs in the ICU. But before he can even reach the hospital, his father died. He died. I did not say he should, one of the family members should die. I did not say that. It's not part of my prayer. I was just saying, Lord, kindly help me. And one of those colleagues who's trying to do harm on me, the following day, I saw on Facebook, he was admitted in the hospital because of heart attack. I'm not saying if somebody will do something hard for you, you pray for them in a way that will harm them. But what I'm saying is the Lord assures you that He will do something in your favor. That's what we're saying. You may have so many problems right now. It could be problem of education, finances, or whatever that is. Trust that God will do something for that problem. Because the Egyptians that you see today, you will never see them anymore. And that's exactly what happened. The Egyptians were rushing to catch the Israelites. 
But you know what God did? He commanded the angel to go in between the pillar of clouds right at their back and the pillar of fire right in front of them. So he's sort of confused. If you go through this story, God is, seems to be so funny. You know what God did? He actually jumped the wheels of the chariots that it could no longer turn. The other verses, the Lord twisted the wheels. Can you imagine somebody twisted your wheel? Or you were driving a car and somebody twisted your wheel? What, hap what will happen to you? You will turn somewhere. You will fall in an accident. So that's exactly what God did. They jumped the wheels so that the Egyptian could not proceed forward. And then they talked to themselves and they said, I think God is trying to do something against us because we were pursuing the Israelites. And by the time they reached the other side of the Red Sea, God commanded Moses again, stretch out your hand and command the sea to return back. And you can imagine all the Egyptians were just drowned. And the following day, they saw all, all these wheels and horses at the shore of the Red Sea. You will see God's salvation happening before your very eyes. If you have seen it yet, it's time for you to see it and be assured that the enemies that you are seeing right now, you will not see them anymore. The last one is trials were designed to prevent you from going back to where you once was. They were on the other side of the Red Sea already, right? Do you think the, Egyptian, the Israelites stopped complaining? Yes or no? They, they didn't. They still complained. They complained of the food. They complained of the water. They complained a lot of so many things. They keep complaining. They're sort of murmuring people just like us. But my question is, Will that murmur bring them back to Egypt? Will they ever go back to Egypt? No. How will they go back to Egypt? They have to pass through the Red Sea again, right? For you to go back to Egypt, you have to pass through the Red Sea. And there's no way you can pass by the Red Sea in those times. So in other words, there may be trials that may happen to our lives today. And after we get rid of those trials, we have a new perspective. Those very trials will prevent us from going back to Egypt. So thank you for the trials. Because those very trials that you want to get rid of will be the same trial that will prevent you from going back. A friend of mine was accused of doing something which, according to him, he did not do. So, he was worried about it and he came to our house and he told us about what actually happened. In contrast to what people are saying, you see, these are things that uh, sometimes are so destructive to us, what people are saying and what actually has happened. So if you will be distracted, you will end up confused yourself. But you, you don't have to be confused. You just have to kneel down and pray. And so what I told him is that, you see, these are trials. And you are, you are past the trials. You are here already. My question is, are you contesting it because he was removed from, from his work. Are you contesting it for you to come back? No way. Don't go back to Egypt. The trials was given to you for you, go, for you to go to the next level. And not for you to go back. Sometimes we are always contesting. Tinanggal niyo ako sir sa work. Wala na akong work. Ba't niyo ako tinanggal dito? But you see... Those were the very trials that God wants you to get rid of. 
That's why he put you on a different level. So why contest going back? Don't contest. Stay where you are. Stay calm. Because you don't need to go back to the Red Sea and go back to Egypt. God wants to bring you somewhere else. So we need to be thankful for the trials that comes to our lives. Because these same trials will prevent us from going back and bring us where God wants us to be. The experience of the Egyptians is so, should I say, complex that what used to be an eight-hour ride from Egypt to Israel, if you take the bus, took them how many hours? Years. Forty years. In fact, if you go to Nehemiah, when they were trying to rebuild Jerusalem, this is the usual thing that I tell the people. Some people doesn't believe in prayer. We just pray. How many hours do we pray? Probably 10 minutes at most, 15 minutes at most. One time I was attending a church board and then I told the pastor, before we start our meeting, can we do devotional first? Can we pray? And the pastor said, it will lengthen our meeting. It will prolong our stay here. So I said, this is not your meeting. The chairman of the board is Jesus. You are not the chairman. This is not your work. This is God's work. So I said, if, if you don't like it, we will hold our devotional. We will pray. The walls of Jerusalem was built for 45 days. Do you know that? And how many days did it take for them to pray prior to that? It took them six months to pray. They prayed six months. They built the walls in 45 days. In our case today, we pray so quickly and we do a lot of work. And we, we are so... We are so uh, surprised how come we cannot finish the work that we're doing because we are praying less we're acting more and so the pastor said doc i think we have to act and we should just uh, pray on our own i said i don't think so the person that you are talking with right now is a product of prayer and fasting so i command you i said I command you. I said to the pastor, we have to pray and fast and have devotional. The problems that we are tackling in this board will be only be tackled if God is right here. The reason why we have so many problems in our school, in our institutions, in our family, in our workplace is because we do not really pray. So we should spend time Praying and asking God for guidance. Follow on young man, according to Mrs. White, to know the Lord and you will know that his going forth is prepared as the morning. Strive earnestly for identity with the Redeemer. Live by faith in Christ. Do the work he did. Live for the saving of the souls for whom he laid down his life. Try in every way to help those with whom you come in contact. Strive continually to improve. Let your life fulfill the words Though through thy commandments hast made me wiser than mine enemies. And you know what? Even your enemies will make peace with you. That's an assurance that God is giving us today. So in closing, let me read in 1 Corinthians 3.19. It says here, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. So we may spend more time praying. As a student, you have many problems. I think I have more problems when I was a student. The challenges that I face every day is humongous, but the Lord is good and the Lord is faithful. God wants us to be faithful rather than successful. It's better to be faithful than to be successful because you might be the best among the best.
But if you lose your soul, that is really nothing. So thank you so much, and may God bless each one of you today. At this point of time, um, I request Dr. De Castro to please rise as we present to you our simple gift coming from the College of Science and Technology and um, a certificate of appreciation. Let me read the citation. Adventist University of the Philippines, Putinka Hoysilang Cavite, College of Science and Technology Student Council. Certificate of Appreciation. This certificate is awarded to Dr. Jimmy Lou De Castro for sharing his time in imparting words of inspiration to the students of the College of Science and Technology during the Divine Hour of Worship held at the Adventist University of the Philippines Gymnasium. Given on the 10th day of October 2015 at the University of the Philippines Gymnasium, Puting Kahoy Silang Cavite. Signed, Daniel Amor Castillo, CSTSC President, Mr. Abraham Raka, CSTSC Advisor, and Dr. Edwin Balila, CST College Dean. Um, I request also Dr. Balila and Sir Evangelista, or one of our advisors, to please um, help me in awarding this certificate. Thank you so much. Next time, I'll be here again.